Hello and welcome back to the Dr. Under Pickle Show. Today I have Doc Smurf on. Hey, what's up, guys? So I'll start with a lot of questions. Uh, where and when did you find 2B2T? I found uh, 2B2T after I left an administrative position with a big server called Element Craft. Um, I was looking for a place where I didn't have to suck up to any moderators after having been one. And uh, I found it in early, I think it was 2013, from an IGN video that's still on YouTube uh, called Six Amazing Things to See in Minecraft. 2B2T Spawn was one of them. And I decided that that sounded like an awesome place to go. And I have been here ever since. And along the way, you know, you've, you've been on, uh, when was that? What year was that? What, you and I joined? Yeah. 2013. So you've been on for what, uh, seven years now? Almost, uh, I, I think about a year and a half short of the lifespan of the server. Nice. So I've been here for a while. So along the way, like maybe what were, what were some allies, maybe some people that you know you didn't quite get along with. Oh uh, well, when I first spawned in, uh, the very first person that I ever met was E to the G. He doesn't play anymore. There were two mines back then. Either you would be killed by somebody, or occasionally you would be geared. Uh, the very first time I left spawn, I actually left spawn with iron armor that E gave me. And I was pretty much a nomad for the first year, year and a half, until I got invited to the Cool Kids Club. Um, I can't remember whether it was Silent Pedro, which you probably know is Fit MC, or uh, Clyde, who invited me to the base. But that was where I started out. Yeah, and what was the deal with the Cool Kids Club and maybe some of the members that were in it? Uh, the Cool Kids Club, you had Silver, Crown King. Uh, you had uh, Clyde. Um, uh, Russell League. I think James Russells was there too. Uh, the Cool Kids Club was more or less just a random assortment of people who didn't really have anywhere else to go. Um, when I describe it, I don't necessarily describe it as a group base because A, there weren't that many people there in the first place, and B, a lot of us were on different time zones. So what would happen is you'd, you'd log into the Cool Kids Club and you'd see like, oh, somebody built this, or you know, there's been some work done on that, etc. But you wouldn't see anyone and then you log off, and then you come back the next day, and you'd see, oh, like, oh, more shit has been done, right? Like, more work has been done. I think the only time I ever directly interfaced with somebody was Silver Crown King uh, when we were making the uh, the large gold farm that was at uh, the Cool Kids Club. Oh, yeah. So you're really good with, you know, redstone and building it. So what was that like, building that gold farm, having the, you know, the idea of making it so large? I don't remember who initially came up with the idea to make this thing. One of the reasons why it was the biggest is because creating them back then was actually very easy. I can't remember which version of Minecraft it was, but somebody can look it up. There was a Obsidian creation glitch where if you... Uh, you know how if you drop water onto lava, it makes Obsidian. But if you drop lava onto water, it makes stone. Yeah. Sorry, uh, lava onto water makes stone. Well, there was a way that if you put lava one block above and to the side of um of water, and then in between the two of them, you had a, a redstone dust. You could actually basically create obsidian without expending lava. It was an obsidian generation glitch with the, the way that lava and water interacted with each other. So it allowed us to make an infinite amount of obsidian. Dang. So that 
that is how we were able to obtain so much obby. Um, I did not personally work on it a whole lot. I think I more helped prepare the zone. Most of the work, and really most of the mining of the obsidian was done by silver. And then I think everybody else mostly just helped with the aesthetics of the, uh, the big pyramid that they decided to put around it at the end. Yeah, and what other what other redstone works have you done? Um, well, there was the that. well, there was the big sort because a lot of people forget that those gold farms are technically mob farms, right? Like, um, you don't, you didn't. What happened was is they funnel all down into one spot, and then you like kill the kill the pig with a sword. So you got exp and you got items. I, I helped make the item sorter there, which back then before. Um, comparators was not fun i don't think we ever saw i don't think we ever totally fixed it it would still clog up with swords every once in a while because the swords wouldn't stack um in terms of large redstone builds uh that base also had a very extensive rail network um at the time rail duping was also a thing so we had a rail duper uh it works pretty similar to the way the carpet duper works now i think in some versions of minecraft uh not in paper uh it still works um, other large redstone projects. Uh, at one point, when we were making a large ice build in 2014, not the the dragon that Fit has a video of, but an ice build before that, we had a ice machine so large at one of my bases that House told us to turn it off because it was causing problems with the server. Um, other than that, I think we had the first or second fully functional item sorting gold uh, guardian farm at the tree. And then I don't know of anybody else who's done this. Um, do you know how tree farms work? Uh, yes. Do you know how tree farms for dark oak trees work though? Cause they're like, no. they're four times as they're, they're two by twos. We managed to create a fully functional automatic dark oak tree farm that would work in sub five T TPS. Dang. It took up like a whole chunk, though. <laughs> it's like not the most efficient thing we've ever built, but we sort of just built it for fun. Um, mostly I'm known for uh, more like aesthetic builds, like the Great Tree and the Ice Dragon, which there's plenty of YouTube videos out there about those. And how long, I mean, uh, like how long did it take to like kind of perfect that style of building? Like to, um, you mean like to, the like the red the redstone or to be able or, to build stuff like the, you know the dragon and the tree and stuff like that. Uh, it was a it was a slow learning process. I mean, the first base that I ever because I have a building group, we don't really have a name for ourselves, and uh, the other people that build with me they don't really interface with the community. Like they don't talk on the Reddit. They're not a part of any groups like Imperium or Spawn Masons or or any of that stuff. I sort of act as like the bridge, I guess, between the autism that is 2B2T communities and the rest of the people who work with me. Um, we started out at a place called Spruceville, which was very, it was like Asgard style, right? Like very disjointed. Everybody kind of built whatever they wanted to. It wasn't really any central theme or anything like that. Uh, when we got to the tree, that was the first time where we sort of went in with an idea of, okay, if all of us just work on one thing, we can probably make something like really big and impressive, right? So that's really the first time that we tried anything like that. Um, the biggest thing that helped us was um, Schematica. Schematica gets a bad rap because some people, what they'll do is they'll take world downloads or, or they'll find schematics of things other people have made, and then they'll make that and claim it's theirs. I know that happened a lot at Block Game Mecca, for example. But what we would do is we came up with a system where we find a place on 2B2T that we want to build. We take a world download of it, like the default terrain, right? We work on it and do all the terraforming, and then we take a schematica of it and then use that to help us set the place up on the server. So we actually build everything we build twice. 
we build it once in creative on our own private server with like world edit tools to help us manipulate things and copy stuff and refine it. Uh, and then when we turn it into a schematic, we then use Schematica to help us take what we've designed and then build it in survival on the server. And that's exactly what it should be used for. Like you said, you know, a lot of people take ownership for builds that clearly aren't theirs. But I mean, if you're just using it to, to bring one thing over from one world to another, it shouldn't really matter. But um, you were also uh, also a part of the X plus Nether Highway um, getting to the world border. Yeah, that was uh, I was technically a late arrival to that. So it's pretty ubiquitous knowledge now that Bernsey got a wild hair one day and decided we're headed to the world border, kids. Who wants to come along? I think I sh when I showed up, they were at a seven or eight million overworld. Um, the experience with the diggers was a relatively positive one. A lot of us got along with each other and a lot of the base drama was prevented. Cause if you get a random group of people and you just throw them together, obviously there's going to be friction, right? But because we had this dedicated goal and we were all working towards one thing, Really, it kept any you know problems between players from cropping up. And then when we did eventually stop to build Nemo and then Dory, we had all known each other for long enough that um, like there wasn't any drama. So we essentially got to know each other on the dig, and then that prevented like you know any BS from occurring when we actually decided to build the large bases. I mostly, um, I did a lot of administrative stuff. I don't know if this is public. I think there's probably copies of it. I can give you one after the interview, too. Um, we kept a spreadsheet record of, like, all the progress and stuff. So I have a bunch of, like, administrative documents of, like, where people were and who dug what and what the dig rates for each day where it was. It was relatively well documented. But that was a, that was a pretty positive experience, I'd say. Yeah, and getting out to the to the world border itself, what was that like making it out there? You know, like, like when we like when we it. like when we finally popped the portal and it was you yeah. know on the other side. Um, it, it's kind of funny because we got there. There had been rumblings that people had been to the world border before using hacks, because as many people know, the server was backdoored multiple times. When we got there, there was a sign from Pop Bob and Tristan. We popped the exit portal and immediately realized. I wasn't there personally, I was in live stream, but everybody realized immediately that the ocean generation was old and that this was essentially old chunks. So that was something that we thought might happen, but didn't really anticipate. It was really crazy for the, for the first while, because, you know, you actually get to go up and touch the world border on a server, like in, in survival. But as you'll know, we also did the corner dig. When, when Dory got blown up, Rather than disbanding, sort of in anger and half, you know, out of spite, we decided, like, all right, well, I guess we'll dig to the corner then. If we can't have peace out here, we'll just go further. Um, and uh, on the corner dig, the border kind of became, like, normal. Because every time you would pop a portal, there'd be a giant blue wall next to you. And after you've seen that thing for months, it just sort of becomes natural, if that makes any sense. So it was it was it was definitely it was definitely cool, but uh, it did uh, the the uh, the luster did eventually wear off as it would with anything. So as you said, you were a part of, of the Cool Kids Club, and you were also part of helping with the world border. What other kind of like bases or group experiences have you done on the server? Uh, those are the two big ticket ones. I mean, obviously, I have the the builds that I've done and that have been featured on various YouTube channels with my own personal build group. Um, I was sort of a tacked on participant in the third incursion. I wasn't really one of the main PVPers back then, but I was known well enough, and I I talked in chat enough that I got invited to that. Watching, well, I didn't place any of the blocks at Wrath. It was it was really great watching people build it. Um, just kind of being there 
when uh, I don't know if it, who had the uh, who had the items, but there was essentially there was a few patches where you were able to have negative item values. So you essentially had an infinite block. So people had like these blocks of infinite ender chests that they would put down to break into obsidian to then make wrath out of, which was pretty cool. Um, that's something I was a part of. Uh, but other than that, I haven't been on any major group bases. Yeah, and what was that like, that entire experience during that incursion uh, with, with Wrath Outpost and everything? I don't remember what sparked that one. I'd have to go back and do some research. But mostly it was... Um, the weirdest part about it was having a bunch of people that are from different groups and some people that didn't even necessarily like each other that much kind of, you know, call a truce for a little bit to build this outpost, at this, like, big obsidian statement about the older players on the server and then just, uh, just slay out, just slay kids out at spawn. And back then, you didn't have anything like crystal PvP, right? So if somebody actually managed to leave and get geared and come back, it was an actual PvP fight, not just a bunch of people running around with aura on, popping totems all the time. There was some actual skill involved to it back then. And that's also before they messed up the combat system, so. Yeah, that was when fighting was actually actually like a like, like a thing. Like nowadays it's just so automated. It's crazy. But uh, on that note, where do you think that the 2v2 team is going to go in the following year? In the following year, I don't really expect that much to change. I think 2v2t is pretty much settled into a, a pretty predictable rhythm, right? There was a question when Rusher first showed up about whether or not the server was going to, like, whether it was going to be a flash in the pan or how long people were going to stick around. But at this point, the the server has enough concurrent users who are willing to come back and pay for priority and like make groups together and get out of spawn and build stuff that it's clear that the player base size is not going to like fall off anytime soon so i think pretty much 2b2t will continue in sort of this ebb and flow of a large influx of players will will occasionally happen. Some people will stick around to add to the main concurrent player base, while most of them will just you know be temporary visitors. But I expect us to stay pretty much in the you know average maybe sixty people in priority queue on the weekends. Server constantly full on the weekends. Uh smaller groups rising and falling pretty much what's happened for the last six or seven months i see us in the same spot in about a year the only thing that would uh, would uh change that up is if the server ever winds up updating and as anybody who's been on 2b2t for a while will know the instability of the more recent minecraft patches really preclude that because they haven't done any major performance updates and 2b2t Larger servers have the same problem with the most recent updates. It's just a problem for large servers in general. But 2B2T is so old and it's been through so many world generations and its map is just has so many difficulties that unless there's some serious performance increases, uh, like it's not going to update. So I expect things on 2B2T to be relatively similar for the next year unless we somehow go up a version. God, I hope Mojang does something because... Uh... It's it's kind of getting sad at this point. There were well, like, they, three, four updates passed. Yeah, this is this is the most out of sync two B two T has ever been with the main patch. Um, and I don't see it getting better anytime soon. And the the worst thing about it is they know that it's messed up. Like they've they've made actual acknowledgments to people who have pointed out these problems, and they just seem to like. I don't know if they don't care. So much as there's just like a performance pass just isn't on the table. They keep saying, like, every time they do a patch and it's not performance related, they say, oh, oh we'll do it next patch. Oh, oh, we'll do it next patch. And then it just, it just never happens. They just keep adding extra stuff that, like, 
nobody asked for. Right? Like, I, I, I appreciate that they're trying to keep the game fresh, which is great, but we've had the last several updates adding, like, meaty changes and items and you know, new enchantments and biomes and this big nether update now, like, it's okay for them to take a patch and just be like, alright, we're gonna fix some stuff. Right? And I, I they, they, were, they were in desperate need of that right now. Well, on that note, um, if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to, to lead us out in? I know, not, not really. I just, uh, I, you know, invite people to uh, enjoy the server. Obviously, um, if if you want to grief, that's fine. If you want to build, if you want to PvP, 2BTT has something for everybody. Um, I would, um, I say this every time I talk to anybody, I would encourage that uh, if you ever find game-breaking exploits or things that can crash the server, to always be thoughtful and think about the consequences before you use something like that because we can't have an anarchy server if the server doesn't run. But other than that, I mean, you're welcome to hang around uh, and enjoy the place. Alrighty then. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Yeah, no problem. Uh, 